Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters fifty nine to sixty three. Chapter fifty nine. Squid. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity her three tall, tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze, as three mild palms on a plain. And still, at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely, alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun glade on the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in this profound hush of the visible sphere, a strange spectre was seen by Dagoo from the main masthead. In the distance a great white mass lazily rose, and, rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleamed before our prow like a snow-slide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly it subsided and sank, then once more arose, and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale. And yet is this Moby Dick, thought Dagoo? Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out, There! There again! There she breaches! Right ahead! The white whale! The white whale! Upon this the seamen rushed to the yard-arms, as in swarming times the bees rushed to the bows. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Dagoo. Whether the flitting attendance of one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular whale he pursued, however this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass than with a quick intensity he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for a moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind— a vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct but undulated there on the billows, an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As, with a low sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again, Starbuck, still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, Almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. "'What was it, sir?' said Flask. "'The great live squid, which, they say, few whale-ships ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it.' But Ahab said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object— 
Certain it is, that a glimpse of it being so very unusual, that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld, that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form. Notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish the sperm whale his only food. For though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface, and only by inference is it that any one can tell of what precisely that food consists. At times, when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them thus exhibited, exceeding twenty and thirty feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the oceans, and that the sperm whale, unlike other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopidan may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it, as alternately rising and sinking, with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, to which, indeed, in certain external respects it would seem to belong, but only as the anak of the tribe. CHAPTER sixty, THE LINE With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope-maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use. Yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar in general by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years the manila rope has, in the American fishery, almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines, for though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic, and, I will add, since there is an aesthetics in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but Manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment its one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of one hundred and twenty pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over two hundred fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of a still, though, but so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow but the heart, or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downward through a block towards the tub, so as, in the act of coiling, to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. 
In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this, because these twin tubs, being so small, they fit more readily into the boat, and do not strain it so much. Whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter, and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness, for the bottom of the whaleboat is like critical ice, which will bear up under a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub, and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat, in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale, of course, is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from one boat to the other though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end, almost in a single smoking minute as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and, passing round the loggerhead there, is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunwales, to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows, and is then passed inside the boat again, and some ten or twenty fathoms, called box-line, being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft, and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon. But previous to that connection, the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale-line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsman they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman for the first time seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put into play like ringed lightnings. He cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you will hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whale-boat, when thus hung in hangman's nooses, and, like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck, as you may say.
Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated wailing disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled, of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost. For when the line is darting out, to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play, when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils, because the boat is rocking like a cradle, and you are pitched one way and the other, without the slightest warning, and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action, can you escape being made a mazeppa of, and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as the profound calm, which only apparently precedes and prophesies of the storm, is perhaps more awful than the storm itself, for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm, and contains it in itself, as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion, so the graceful repose of the line, as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play, this is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in a whale-boat, you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than those seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Chapter 61 Stubb Kills a Whale If, to Starbuck, the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Queequeg it was quite a different object. When you see him quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him parm whale. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. For this part of the Indian Ocean through which we were voyaging is not what whalemen call a lively ground, that is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the Rio de la Plata or the inshore ground off Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and, with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds, to and fro I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it. In that dreamy mood, losing all consciousness, at last my soul went out of my body, though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum will, long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn. Ere forgetfulness altogether came over me, I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman. The waves, too, nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes, like vices my hands grasped the shrouds, some invisible, gracious agency preserved me. With a shock I came back to life. And lo, close under our lee, not forty fathoms off, a gigantic sperm-whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate, his broad, glossy back of an Ethiopian hue, glistening in the sun's rays like a mirror. But lazily undulating in the trough of the sea, and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet, 
The whale looked like a portly burgher smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon. But that pipe, poor whale, was thy last. As if struck by some enchanter's wand, the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness, and more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel, simultaneously with the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry, as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. "'Clear away the boats! Luff!' cried Ahab, and, obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale, and ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward, but with such a steady tranquillity, and making so few ripples as he swam, that, thinking after all he might not as yet be alarmed, Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers. So, seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air, and then sank out of sight like a tower swallowed up. "'There go flukes!' was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite was granted." After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and, being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honour of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped, and oars came loudly into play. And still puffing at his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out, that part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Footnote. It will be seen in some other place of what a very light substance the entire interior of the sperm whale's enormous head consists though apparently the most massive, it is by far the most buoyant part about him, so that with ease he elevates it in the air, and invariably does so when going at his utmost speed. Besides, such is the breadth of the upper part of the front of his head, and such the tapering cut-water formation of the lower part, that by obliquely elevating his head, he thereby may be said to transform himself from a bluff-bowed sluggish galliot into a sharp-pointed New York pilot boat. End of footnote. Starter! Starter, my men! Don't hurry yourselves. Take plenty of time. But starter! Starter like thunderclaps, that's all! cried Stubb, spluttering out the smoke as he spoke. Starter now! Give him the long and strong stroke, Tashtego! Starter, Tash, my boy! Starter all! But keep cool! Keep cool. Cucumbers is the word. Easy, easy. Only starter like grim death and grinning devils, and raise the buried dead perpendicular out of their graves, boys. That's all. Starter. Woohoo! Why he! screamed the gay header in reply, raising some old war whoop to the skies, as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Kihi, kihi! yelled Dagoo, straining forwards and backwards on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala, kulu! howled Queequeg as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of grenadier's steak. And thus, with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperadoes they tugged and they strained, till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tashtego! Give it to him! The harpoon was hurled. Stern all! The oarsmen backed water, 
the same moment something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand-cloths or squares of quilted canvas sometimes worn at these times had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. "'Wet the line! Wet the line!' cried Stubb to the tub oarsman, him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed sea-water into it. Footnote. Partly to show the indispensableness of this act, it may here be stated that in the old Dutch fishery a mop was used to dash the running line with water. In many other ships a wooden piggin or baler is set apart for that purpose. Your hat, however, is the most convenient. End of footnote. More turns were taken, so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water, like a shark, all fins. Stubb and Tashtego here changed places, stem for stern, a staggering business, truly, in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from its now being more tight than a harp-string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water, the other the air, as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows, a ceaseless whirling eddy in her wake, and at the slightest motion from within, but even of a little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat, to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tashtego at the steering oar crouching almost double in order to bring down his centre of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacifics seemed past as they shot on their way, till at length the whale somewhat slackened his flight. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing round towards the whale all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish, at the word of command the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow, and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster, like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun playing upon this crimson pond in the sea sent back its reflection into every face, so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart hauling in upon his crooked lance, by the line attached to it, Stubb straightened it again and again, by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, and then again and again sent it into the whale. "'Pull up! Pull up!' he now cried to the bowsman, as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath. "'Pull up! Close to!' and the boat ranged along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish, and kept it there, carefully churning and churning, as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking, ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish. And now it is struck." for, starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, 
the monster horribly wallowed in his blood, overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad, boiling spray, so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of day. And now, abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout-hole, with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frighted air, and, falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. "'He's dead, Mr. Stubb,' said Tashtego. "'Yes, both pipes smoked out.' and withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and, for a moment, stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. CHAPTER 62 THE DART A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale-boat pushes off from the ship, with the headsman or whale-killer as temporary steersman, and the harpooner or whale-fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner oar. Now, it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of twenty or thirty feet, but however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and intrepid exclamations. And what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass, while all the other muscles are strained and half-started, what that is none know but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot bawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one at the same time. In this straining, bawling state, then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, Stand up and give it to him. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn round on his centre halfway, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and, with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat." No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most wanted? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat-header and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft, to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and every one else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale, as the before-described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from out of idleness, and not 
from out of toil. Chapter 63 The Crotch Out of the trunk the branches grow, out of them the twigs. So, in productive subjects, grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow, for the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked, barbed end slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily from its rest as a backwoodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line, the object being this, to dart them both if possible, one instantly after the other, into the same whale, so that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still retain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances. But it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, hence that weapon must at all events be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat, somehow and somewhere, else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water it accordingly is in such cases, the spare coils of box-line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat in most instances prudently practicable. But this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again, until the whale is fairly captured, and a corpse. Consider, now, how it must be, in the case of four boats, all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when, owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him, for, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend on to the line, should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate, passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. End of chapters 59-60